When I was first learning my craft as a colorist, one of the aspects of color grading that I found the most complex and overwhelming was the scopes. What exactly are those things? What are they there to tell me? How do I need to use them? How do I read them at all? All these things were really mysterious to me and it actually took me years before I really understood how to properly use scopes and before I found a way to incorporate them into my workflow that really worked for me and helped me achieve my best results as a colorist. And that's what I wanna talk about today is how I use scopes, how I don't use scopes and really what scopes can and can't tell us uh, in the larger picture as well. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about it here inside of Resolve and look at the way that I like to use scopes in my workflow as a professional colorist. So first things first, all I've done thus far in my project is the things that I always do at the beginning of a project. I've set up my overall color management. If you're not uh, familiar with color management or you need to get a refresher on it, we've got lots of content here on the channel talking about color management. I encourage you to check out my DaVinci Wide Gamut Workflow series where I'll show you the exact color management setup that I'm using here in today's video. And the other thing that I've gone ahead and incorporated into this workflow is I have added an overall look here at the timeline level of my node graph. This look happens to come from my brand new Voyager LUT pack. This happens to be Canberra. And as you can see, it's adding a nice sort of baseline creative rendering of my image before I even begin grading. This is a critical part of a really, really efficient and great grading workflow for any professional. And I encourage you to check out these tools if you're eager to incorporate a macro level creative transform, better known as a look into your grades so that you can get better work done faster and really focus on those fine tuned finesse adjustments that we get to at the very end of a grade and that we usually run out of time before we're able to start addressing. Okay. Now I'm going to go back over here to the clip level and we're going to talk about the way that I use scopes in my workflow. Let's turn this tab off for now. So we've got a nice sized image and let's talk about the two scopes that I like to work with when I'm grading. Now, there are lots of different scopes you can use in Resolve. I'm not gonna cover all of them. I'm gonna talk about the two that I use and why. I like to use, first of all, the histogram. The histogram is where I evaluate my exposure and my contrast choices. And you can see that the histogram is essentially telling me about the tonal distribution of my image. So I've got shadows on the left, highlights on the right, and the amount of pixels living in those various areas in between represented by the height of that track, okay? And you can see I've got this for red, and green and blue. And if you were to show me just this histogram without showing me the image, I could tell you a couple things. I could tell you it's a reasonably healthy image in terms of overall contrast. I've got some uh, shadows that are near zero, I've got some highlights that are nearing uh, the 100% position. And I've got uh, a peak here in the middle area where there are lots of pixels that happen to be clustered up. And I could also tell you that my red channel happens to be just a little bit stronger than my green and my blue. And for example, if I wanted to bring that red channel more in line with the green and the blue, I could go over here to my primaries bars and I could look at my gain and just pull my red gain in just a little bit. Okay. So that's kind of what the histogram tells me off the bat. Now let's talk about the vector scope. The vector scope is probably the scope that I look at most often when I'm grading. And before we go any further, let's just come up with a simple definition for what exactly scopes are. Scopes are just an objective measurement device. That's it. What's an objective measurement device? That's like a tape measure, right? It tells you not that's about 12 inches or that's about three feet, but exactly that's 37 inches. That's 11 inches. That's a foot and a half, whatever it may be. It's just a way of objectively measuring your image. Okay. Ultimately, the most important thing in your color grading practice is what you see and what your client sees and getting to a place that you really love what you're seeing, but the scopes can be really helpful in helping you get there. Okay. So vector scope. The vector scope, unlike the histogram, which is telling us all about exposure and contrast, the vector scope is going to tell us about color. It's going to tell us how much color and in what hue direction that color exists when we look at the signal mass occupying the center of the vector scope. Now, just for a quick experiment, let's go over here to the timeline level, turn off our look, go back here to the clip level, and just turn our saturation all the way down to zero. What do I get in my vector scope? I just get a little bullseye, right? I'm fully achromatic, I'm fully desaturated, and that's represented here in the vector scope by being parked perfectly on that bullseye and having none of the signal mass point in any other direction. And you can see as I'm adding saturation back that I'm pointing further and further in the direction of, uh, in this case, the red and yellow vectors that happen to be dominating this image. I'm gonna go ahead and reset that back to zero. That's essentially what the vector scope is telling me is 
what direction are what hues existing in your image and how strongly uh, are those hues present in your image okay so those are the main things that I uh, the two main scopes I should say that I rely on when I'm color grading now let's talk about some of the ways that I will use scopes overall the way that I use scope as we kind of alluded to a minute ago I'm not using scopes to tell me what to do we're going to talk more about the, that in a minute scopes are not my second client as it were I'm using scopes to tell me what I'm doing. Does that make sense? I'm using them to give me feedback on what I've done and where it's taking the image. So in the case of an image like this, I might look at it and say, well, with my color management setup and with my look in place over here that I'm gonna turn back on, this is actually looking pretty decent, but the skin doesn't feel quite right. I feel like my subject's skin could be brought to life a little bit more. There's more that I could do for it here. What I'll often do in that situation is look at this skin tone indicator line here in the vector scope, which you can turn on if it's not already by going to this little menu here and saying show skin tone indicator. And if I'm not loving my skin tone and I want to see if I can get a better looking rendering of my skin tone, often what I will do is look at my vector scope, look at the skin tone line, go to my balance node in my node graph. If you're curious about this node graph that I'm using, I've got a dedicated video on that as well. You can go check it out to see what I've got set up here and why I work this way. But for now, I'm gonna to go to my balance node and I'm just gonna look at taking this signal mass and trying to get it to straddle that skin tone line just a little bit more. I'm just moving my offset wheel up to the Northeast. Actually, I'm moving my gain, which isn't what I wanna do. Let's make it my offset, okay? So I'm just gonna move that up kind of to the Northeast so that my signal mass is straddling that line, okay? Now, if you don't like what this is doing, you don't have to use it. This is simply here to give you ideas and uh, some information about where you're at and where you might wanna go. But in this case, as is often the case, I think this is really doing what I want. Maybe it's a little too much and I'll back it off, but this is really helping me to quickly arrive at a better skin tone rendering for my eye, okay? So that's one example of the way that I will use the scopes is as a diagnostic for skin tone. Now, again, I wanna emphasize, not all skin will or needs to live in a tight alignment with this skin tone indicator. However, if you're not in love with where your skin tone is living, it can be a good diagnostic tool for uh, trying out and seeing if you're getting a better skin tone rendering when you move the signal mass more in alignment with that skin tone line, okay? Now, let's talk about this sequence of shots that I have coming up next, and let's just play through these. So I've got shot two, the wide shot, I'm gonna go to a single, and then we're gonna go to a reverse, all right? Now, if I play through these a couple times, I can feel, I can see, I don't love how these flow together. They don't feel super silky in terms of the way that the cuts are going from one to the next. It feels like the balance is shifting a little bit. Exposure and contrast feels pretty decent, but the balance feels like it's really shifting a bit between images. Now, what's exactly happening between those? Show this to me enough times and I feel like I could give you a decent diagnosis, but another way that I will often use my scopes is to quickly tell me, am I actually seeing an imbalance there? Am I crazy? Or if I am seeing that imbalance, if it really is there, where is it? What's differing between these two shots so, or these three shots in this case? But for now, let's focus on shots three and four and look at shot three rolling into shot four. So you can see I'm not crazy. Like these signal masses are really shifting between these two shots. And a good rule of thumb to keep in mind, if you wanna get shots flowing together and feeling more aligned, is the more you can get their signal masses to kind of stack up and overlap, generally the more flow, the more fluidity you're going to feel when you cut between those two shots, okay? So in this case, I feel like we can get a bit more flow between these. This shot is skewing a little bit more kind of pinky magenta, and this shot is skewing a bit more kind of greeny yellow, all right? So what I'm gonna do here is start by setting my anchor or my hero. I'm gonna pick shot number four fairly arbitrarily. I could also pick not, uh, shot number three, but I'm gonna go with shot four just because I feel like it's maybe a little closer. And I'm once again gonna go to my offset and I'm gonna kind of nudge that to the Southwest, okay? I'm gonna go off and then on. I don't wanna lose too much warmth. I just wanna get a little bit away from that kind of pink realm. And again, my sort of rough uh, compass bearing here is to look at my skin tone indicator and to look at trying to get my signal kind of more evenly straddling that line, okay? So here in the image, honestly, that's a fairly subtle nudge. That's not a massive adjustment, but it is uh, perceptible. 
and you can also see the adjustment in the vector scope. Okay. Now I'm going to grab a still of this and let's go over to shot number three and compare. All right. So we've already got two shots that are two signal masses, I should say, that are overlapping more than they were a minute ago. But I think we can go a bit further because in addition to shot number four being a little bit kind of uh, magenta pink, shot number three is a little bit sort of greeny yellow. All right, so I'm once again going to go to my balance node over here, and I'm going to move this up to the kind of northeast, like so. Little nudges, little bit goes a long way, especially when you're working color managed, like we always are here on the channel. So I'm just making little nudges of my offset ball, like so. Of course, I'm doing this with a control surface. You don't have to do it with a control surface. You could do it with your mouse. But for fine-tuned adjustments like this, I find the control surface especially useful. And if I turn this off and then on, that may already be too far, to be honest with you. I'm going to back it off a little bit. But now if I start to wipe between the two, I'm seeing two significant things. First of all, the two shots agree with each other better than they did a minute ago. And second of all, the vector scope is accurately predicting that because these two signal masses overlap more than they did a minute ago. Does that make sense? So that's another way that I will use my scopes is as a way of evaluating, all right, how can I get some better flow between these images? And to be honest, I feel like I could go a little bit less yellow and a little bit more toward that magenta axis here with this image, even still. Yeah, there we go. That's even feeling better, to be honest. Maybe a bit far, but this is a good example of, you know, the scopes can tell you so much and they can get you so far, but ultimately your eye needs to be the final judge. The scopes are just there to give you an assist. They're there to be your co-pilot, all right? You wanna leave the final task of deciding what looks good, what feels good, what's too far, what's not far enough. That needs to come down to you and to uh, the collaborators who you are working with, okay? So I'm gonna quit fussing over this now, but we're gonna go off and then on and wipe. And I think that's feeling pretty good for those, okay? Now, last thing that I will use my scopes for on a regular basis is as a way of evaluating how far is too far when we're doing something more extreme. So let's look at this wide shot and just say for argument's sake that the direction I'm getting from my client is we really want to go for like a warm thing. We really want this image to feel warm. So I'm now going to grab my gain and just start to push warmth into the image. And I'm watching my vector scope to determine like, okay, is this more of like a yellowy warmth? Is this more of like a reddish warmth? I can kind of use the scopes to guide the movement of my trackball like so, but I'm roughly going Northwest. Now things are starting to get kind of zany, aren't they? This isn't looking great, but it's entirely possible that I could be working with a client who's saying, no, I really want that. I want that push look, take it to an 11, let's do it. One of the th main things, one of the main sort of like tools in my toolkit that I will break out in that situation to know when we are truly going too far and to gently share that with the room is to look at my scopes and to look at the vector scope and to say, hey, you know what? I got to tell you, when I look at my flight instruments here, when I look at my scopes, we are moving into essentially a monochromatic realm with what we are doing to this image. And you can see I'm right about that. Up here in this upper left-hand corner, all of my signal mass is now living in one quadrant of the vector scope. Every single pixel in this image is now some variation of low or high saturation, red, orange, or yellow, isn't it? That's a very low color contrast situation that's approaching a monochromatic situation, right? So that's all objective information that I can share with my client. Now, they may want to take that information and do something with it, or they may say, nope, we don't care, Colin, it's what we want, keep going, in which case that's fine, but I do find it to be helpful for myself and for the people I'm working with to just give that little bit of a reality check and say, hey, we're pushing now into a fully monochromed zone, or if we go even further to say, hey, we're actually starting to push past the boundary of what our display can even show. So we're gonna to start to get artifacts and clipping and really unpleasant uh, pixels in our image, unless we back this off a little bit. That's all data that I can share with the people I'm working with in a gentle way. That's not just me spouting, that's sharing objective information that I'm gleaning from my scopes. Okay. So that's the last thing that I will often use scopes for is as a kind of boundary checker for when I'm going too far or for when the feedback I'm getting is causing us to go too far in a particular direction. Now, last couple things that I want to talk about when it comes to scopes. First of all, we've talked about what I do use scopes for. I want to talk about what I don't use scopes for. We alluded to this a minute ago. 
I do not use scopes as a second client, if that makes sense. My client gets a vote. I will weigh in if they want my opinion, but the scopes don't get a vote. If we're happy with the grade, I'm not going to look at my scopes and go, oh no, someone told me that I shouldn't do this or my scopes should never look like that. So I need to go back and change the grade so that the scopes look different. That's not the way that I work. I was taught to work that way, but that's not the way that I work today. The scopes don't get a vote. The scopes work for me. I don't work for the scopes. Okay. So that's uh, the other thing I want to emphasize. There's how I use scopes. There's how I don't use scopes. And then the last thing that I want to talk about in closing is how the scopes actually can't be used. The things that the scopes couldn't tell you, even if you wanted to listen to them. All right. I want to give you two examples of this. First, let's look at shot number six here. I've got a compound node down here in the lower right hand corner that we're just going to call adjustment X. What's happening in there is kind of complicated and it honestly doesn't matter. It's a series of adjustments to our saturations and hues in our image, and it is nonlinear in nature. And the reason I want to point it out to you is if I turn it off and on, off, on, it's doing a definite thing to my image, right? See how it's really waking up those skin tones in what I think is a pleasing way. But take a look at the vector scope. The vector scope is really failing to describe what I'm seeing there, isn't it? Like it's moving. I'm not saying it's not changing, but what does this mean to me versus what does that mean to me? I don't know. That's not really useful. And if I take this adjustment too far, the scopes aren't going to show me anything obvious in there to say, hey, you've really gone over an edge. This is the type of adjustment that only I and my client can rule on whether it is successful or not. The scopes cannot help me. The scopes can't tell me what I need to know, which is, is this working? Is this feeling good or is it feeling weird? The scopes can't tell me that in this situation. And if I wait for them to, I'm just going to get into trouble. Okay. So that's one example of something that the scopes just can't tell us. Here's an even more basic example. Let's look at shot number seven here. I've got another mystery adjustment. I'm doing these mystery adjustments because I want to focus on the result of the operation, not the operation itself. So let's turn this off and on. And look at the image off and on. So you can see we're getting a good bit more kind of like density and inkiness down there in our shadows, right? We're changing the contrast of this image when I do this in what I think is a pleasing way, right? However, take a look at the histogram over there on the lower left. Again, it's not that it's not changing at all, but it's really not giving me meaningful feedback as to the extent of the change in the image, is it? It's just kind of shifting around a little bit, but there's no big tail being told by the histogram in this case. So that's another example of something that the scopes really can't tell us. They can tell us that something has changed, but unlike when I say move my balance a little toward magenta or toward blue or whatever, where I can see that reflected in my scopes, these adjustments are not going to produce changes in our scopes that make us go, oh, I've gone too far or, oh, I found the perfect balance point. I found the sweet spot. The scope simply can't tell us what we need to know about these kind of adjustments. If the goal is to figure out, have I gone too far? Have I gone far enough? Have I found the perfect middle position? The scopes can't give us that answer in the case of certain operations like this. And really those operations to uh, put a thumbnail on them are going to be nonlinear remappings of saturations or nonlinear remappings of color. So that could be basically any type of curve that we are using to affect our saturations or our uh, tonal or our contrast values. When we start to make fine tuned manipulations of those parameters, our scopes are not going to give us a very explicit tale of what we've just done. And we're really just going to have to rely on our eye and on feedback from our client to decide whether what we've just done is successful and whether we have done the right amount of it. Okay. So I hope that's a helpful overview of how I use scopes, how I don't use scopes, and really what scopes can and can't tell us in the first place. As I said, when I began my career, I found scopes so confusing and intimidating, and it took me a long while, longer than I think it should have, to find the right role for them to play in my color grading workflow, which again, just to emphasize, should be to help you arrive at what you and your client feel is the strongest possible rendering of your image.